parents who are sitting home who are basically powerless at work. They have bosses. They're powerless uh, on, the, on the roads. There's, there's police and traffic wardens and cops watching them. Um, they have no means to, to feel strong. And so they tend to watch sports as a, a substitute. They project themselves into a game which they never participate in. But as long as their team wins, they feel something's happening in their life that's positive and it's successful. It's a very good substitute for many, many things as far as the elite are concerned. Now, the, the big think tanks that involved uh, many professional people knew that uh, they'd have to give something this for, for the males and for the women they'd also give a substitute too. The intention being ultimately to alter society, drastically alter it so much uh, that even the purpose, for instance, of marriage would uh, lose any appeal. For the females, they gave them high fashion, accessible uh, prices for high fashion clothes. Um, they brought in, people don't realize, they brought in the miniskirt back in the 1920s during Prohibition. They brought in cocaine at the same time as along, along with the booze to get young people in. The idea being uh, that uh, if you're doing something illegal, it's very naughty. Uh, youngsters love to break the rules, uh, get together, we're all being naughty together. And sex and booze, you know, coupled with coke being smuggled in at that time, had its uh, desired effects but not quite the way it was designed to have by those that planned that culture, the Bernays types. And Bernays was heavily involved in this. So they came out, as I say, with uh, not sex and rock and roll, but sex in a form of jazz. The Charlton dance came in, uh, the miniskirt came in, sex became rather rampant for the first time. All the old traditional taboos were broken with one generation, but there was fallout to this change, this massive change in culture. The fallout being uh, that they did not have the antibiotics to treat all the sexually transmitted disease that came along. Secondly, they didn't have the legal abortion clinics to take care of uh, the unwanted children that also were produced by hyper-promiscuity. They opened up big orphanages to try and take care of this, the boys' towns, they had ones for girls too. But there was so much backlash, especially in the United States, uh, from the old uh, Christian communities that they had to tone it all down. It kind of flopped, as I say. Sexually transmitted disease became rampant. So did unwanted pregnancies and abortions. Uh, and so they went back to the drawing board because remember, before this all happened, uh, the big players, the new high priesthood, we'll call them, of uh, the Time Lords, those who create the future, work in think tanks for the big establishment, um, had a definite mandate. The only problem was how do you achieve that mandate over a time period. So they went back to the drawing board and they've always known, for instance, that wartime, in wartime, more children are produced because people, young people, who might go off to die tomorrow tend to be far more promiscuous. They brought this back after World War II big time and worked on it steadily. All our tax money went into one particular area of research not just for the atomic weaponry and so on, it went into finding ways of finding a contraceptive that was effective. When they found it and launched it on the scene, at the same time as it, as it launched what they called pop music, uh, along with drugs, LSD and so on, they, 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 they brought out a contraceptive. So then permission was given in a sense and promoted from the top down, even from the BBC, which is member the BBC is owned by the British government. It's an arm of the British government. It talks on behalf of the dominant minority who rule Britain. So they began to promote all this stuff. All the DJs they'd bring on television would interview the top pop stars of the day. They were all stoned out their minds. Some of them were falling out of chairs. And the interviewers would say, tee hee, aren't we naughty children? All aimed at a young generation to emulate. This is what we do, monkey see monkey do. Once again, remember the prime intent was to break the old culture of uh, boy meets girl, um, going together for a while, getting engaged, getting married, having children. The family unit, they'd said when they had the League of Nations, which was the precursor of the United Nations, said they'd have to destroy the family unit. Pretty well all of H.G. Wells's non-fiction books uh, promotes all of this agenda. 
And in fact, he coined the term in the late 1800s. This is how far back this agenda of promiscuity had to go. He coined the term uh, free love. And in one of his books written before 1890, he says, we must uh, promote free love in order to destroy and end the obsolete family unit. And once that's done, he said, uh, the family is no longer in the way when government comes for an individual. Each individual be, will be solely responsible to the government itself, and no family will stand up around them like a primitive tribe and defend them. At the same time, the foundations within the United States and Britain and elsewhere um, were funding what appeared to be far-left groups, communist groups. Uh, so much so, as I say, the Rees Commission went in to look into this from the 50s uh, to find out why top capitalists who owned international corporations and banks, international banks, were, f were putting up foundations to fund far-left groups. Well, we know now it was, it was to, to literally destroy the old culture in order to bring in the new culture, the new society. So therefore you have the proliferation of sexual activity. Uh, the fallout still came from um, uh, unwanted pregnancies, far reduced than it had before because of contraception. But then came the, the lead of the feminist charge, again funded by the Rockefeller Foundation in the States. Uh, to spearhead and demonstrate and demand the rights for abortion. If they could get the public to devalue human life, and that's in the writings of Julian Huxley. He says if we can get society to, to devalue human life, he says, and take humanity off its pedestal as a supreme being on the planet, uh, then, he said, we can bring in our, in our controlled uh, society uh, with a workable population. Everything works within culture towards an agenda. And as Plato said, so long ago, over 2,300 years ago, he said culture and cultural changes must be authorized from the top. If it's grassroots, truly grassroots, then it's outside of the elite's control and ripple effects could, could occur and it could spread anywhere. They couldn't control it, contain it anymore. Therefore, the major changes in culture, which Plato said came through drama and the emulation of actors, actresses, including fashions that they wore and the music they heard, had to be strictly regulated and authorized from the top. The whole science of this, which was always a science and understood by those in those businesses, was used to the maximum to literally alter, drastically alter culture so radically in the 60s and 70s that they could never return to a past way of living. We tie that in with another big player, Lord Bertrand Russell, who had experimental schools uh, under royal charter, where he could do things that anyone else would be locked up for doing. He said in his own schools, and there were mixed schools, he said that if he could encourage prepubertal uh, sexuality amongst the children, encourage multiple partners from before puberty, he says the chances, because of study and, and observation, the chances of them ever bonding with one person for the rest of their life was uh, pretty well obsolete, null and void, wouldn't happen. Therefore, that technique all came into play during the 60s. Uh, it was called free love. Uh, drugs helped it along the way. Um, and that was the beginning of, of what we saw as short-term relationships. Um, divorces became more and more common. Interesting enough, enough uh, divorces really took off not because society demanded it or, or it came from a need or demand from the people. Divorces took off because the Hollywood stars, and remember too, the drama industry, the entertainment industry have always said this, the people follow the stars. And uh, they're the guiding stars in, in the so-called occult, you see. We tend to worship wealth and people and famous people. We want to be like them. We want to identify with them. Uh, the whole idea of divorces came out from Hollywood, the top stars leading the charge for this. Women started to talk about it, uh, who was getting divorced, what actress from what guy and so on. And gradually it put the idea across to them that, well, if they're getting divorced, then maybe so should I. At the same time, the Bourdais techniques were used through all kinds of magazines. At that time, 
97% of all magazine publications were aimed at women. Because advertisers have said, and it's still taught in marketing schools today, uh, women are far more easy to, to get to go along with something new than males are. So within all these magazines and write-ups about their famous actresses, their, their heroines and so on, the rich ones, the average women were, were reading these stories and identifying with them. They were being told that you can do anything, you can have it all, you could have a career, you can have a family, you had a home. They gave them utter lies and they, they coined the term superwoman. So across the whole of Europe and the States and Canada, at the same time, always coordinated at the same time, the media and entertainment industry were push promoting stories of superwomen. And they'd find someone, real or, or imaginary, we'll never know, who supposedly was a CEO of a company, who had all these children at home, had a great husband, could manage everything and could cook great cuisine, blah, blah. And that, uh, of course, is a fantasy. This put pressure again on most women to try and live up to the fantasy, as all advertising does. And most of the stuff we're getting is advertising, or at the very least, is basic um, psychological manipulation. Bernays techniques again. Remembering too that he called it the, the creation of a consumer society. Well-behaved people, as long as there's money going around, they would go into the material world and they would forgo having children. That's the same thing as Charles Galton Darwin talks about. If we can encourage the, the woman and the male to, to, to go after the material benefits of the world, there's a, there's a slimmer chance they'll actually have children who tend to be economically burdensome. People were addicted to television in a very short space of time. Um, most people still today think that all entertainment uh, to do with movies, drama, is, is, is there for nothing more than their entertainment. It never ever was that case. Uh, the greatest social messages are promoted through movies and drama, high drama, through the fixation of emotive sequences, emotional sequences, not logical, factual sequences, but pushing points across in an emotion, emotional way which register and fix in the mind. So emotional content is very, very important rather than going through an actual discussion or an argument using logic and facts. There's no debates. And when you're being downloaded through fiction, your guard is down, the sensor part of your brain is not in, uh, in action as you would in a debate or a lecture. You're actually in an alpha state being completely downloaded with new ideas. Very similar to a computer. And so therefore, an, an, a culture industry, which is called by its, by its own the culture industry. The Soviet Union had a department called the culture industry. Their actors and directors were called the cultural leaders. All you have to do is keep giving them new updates every so often and you can change an entire country or a nation or a block of nations who are all getting the same uploads, upgrades at the same time along certain paths.